Peter Jusick was involved in the very first studies of infant speech perception and became over the next 30 years one of the most prolific and influential forces in the study of infant speech perception of spoken language. In 2001, Peter's career was cut short by a heart attack when he was only 53. We hired Peter in 1975. At that time, he had published papers based on all of his theses, as best I can tell. His honors thesis work at Brown, and two papers with his uh, doctoral and master's supervisor, Debbie Kemmler, at Penn. His undergraduate research, published in Science, not only reported an important finding about young infants' speech perception capabilities, but maybe even more importantly, showed that it was possible to explore them. Dalhousie was uh, Peter's first home as a faculty member. Uh, on his way to Johns Hopkins, where he spent most of his career, he spent a few years at the University of Oregon and at SUNY at Buffalo. And he also had a fruitful collaboration with Jacques Mailer at his uh, cognitive science and psycholinguistics lab in Paris. Much of Peter's work and his conceptual scheme for organizing it was presented in this 1997 book. At the end of 2015, Kevin Monhall of Queens had just completed a Peter-inspired road trip on which he visited about 30 uh, North American universities, sadly not Dalhousie, during which he hatched the idea of a traveling lecture series in Peter's honor. To this email message, I replied, <laughs> I think your idea is an excellent one. But as I was no longer chair, I forwarded Kevin's message to Tara and several members of the department, all of whom were equally enthusiastic about it. So Kevin formed a steering committee of members from the different universities, and planning began. Later, uh, to this list I showed earlier, the uh, LSCP in Paris was added because of Peter's collaboration with Jacques Mailer. And later again, I suggested that Dalhousie, where Peter held his first job, uh, was celebrating our 70th anniversary in 2018 during, as everyone knows here, Dalhousie's 200th, and that we would be happy to host the inaugural lecture in this traveling lecture series, assuming that was possible. So the offer was accepted. Yay. <laughs> When Peter left for Oregon, circa 1981, uh, we hired Janet Worker, who unfortunately for us only stayed here for about three years. Having Janet present this inaugural lecture is appropriate for so many reasons, but most important among them is how her work has built on Peter's legacy. As noted in the program, Janet's numerous contributions have resulted in numerous recognitions including her appointments as Killam Professor at UBC, Canada Research Chair, Fellow of the Royal Society, and most recently as an Officer of the Order of Canada. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Janet Worker, who will now take over and give you a talk. Thanks, Ray. So you guys can hear me? I don't have a very loud voice. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's a real honor to uh, be giving this first inaugural lecture in the Peter Jusic um, series. Um, and as Ray said, my first job at Dalhousie, my, Dalhousie was my first job as well, and I was the first tenure track um, person. <laughs> Dick Aslan, Chuck Nelson, Pat Cool, a whole bunch of speech researchers um, were at that meeting, and it was a two-week meeting. So we spent, that was the first time I spent a lot of time with him, and in subsequent years, uh, we were at a lot of small meetings together. We became very close friends. Um, we never actually published together, which is really surprising, but it was really important to my career. So the, the talk that I've put together is rather than talking, giving my sort of standard talk, or one of my standard talks, I've tried to weave 
my work into Peter's work um, to highlight his legacy um, in five areas, launching a field, speech perception in young infants, becoming a native listener, um, segmenting and representing words, the foundations of word learning, and then some of his bigger legacy contributions. And as I said, I'm highlighting his work and then the intersections with my work, because he influenced me, and then I influenced him, and then it was back and forth, and um, really meaningful. So, never given this talk before, I'll probably never give this talk again, so let's have a little journey together. Okay, and I'm not talking, touching on really anybody else's work except Peter's and mine, um, very much at all. Okay. So, as um, Ray said, the field of infant speech perception was launched. There have been a couple of publications before that time, but it really was the science paper in 1971 that brought the field to life and that got everybody, including me, interested. And so basically what um, was reported in that initial paper. At that time, we understood speech perception to be perceived categorically in that you're better able to discriminate phonetic differences like ba, pa, um, only if you can also give them labels. The story has gotten more complicated, but that's what we understood at that time. And what they asked in this paper was whether there was organization that was categorical like in young infants as well. So they tested infants of one to four months using a high amplitude sucking paradigm that was also really brought into the experimental psych work um, at the same time at Brown um, by Siegeland. Um, and basically what babies do is they like to suck. You put something in their mouth, they'll suck. And this was a high amplitude. It was a contingent paradigm. So every time the babies gave a suck that was strong for them, you got their baseline amplitude, they got to hear a sound. And so using that, they habituated infants. They presented over and over again a sound such as this ba. And then they changed it. Uh, after habituation, they would introduce a new sound. And this is um, a 60 millisecond difference that crosses, actually it's only a 20 millisecond difference, that crosses a natural boundary between ba and pa in a lot of the world's languages. And they also had within category a non-change. What they found is that when babies were habituated to a sound on one side of the boundary and then given a sound uh, on the other side of a natural phonetic boundary in one of the world's languages, there was a recovery in the number of high amplitude sucks, not when it was within category and not when there was no difference in state down following habituation. And this launched the field of infant speech perception because it indicated to us that the kind of categorical-like perception, the kind of organization that we see in adults doesn't just come from experience, that there's a foundation for it um, in early development that might be um, evolutionarily based. So subsequent studies in that field, he and others um, looked at more phonetic differences, not just voicing, place, vowels, they looked at syllable position, could babies do this at the, uh, in the middle, not just the beginning and end of syllables, they asked what the representation was, is it the segment, the book part, and they found no, it's most likely at the syllable level, they asked what's the role of attention, um, and they found that babies could change their focus from the syllable to the segment, the segment to the syllable, depending upon a lot of things, including the coarseness or fineness of the habituation or familiarization set. They asked whether babies could remember these sounds over some period of time and found that at 12 weeks they could remember them over two, mu over two minutes. <clears throat> By I think it was six or seven months they could remember them over uh, two weeks. And they found that babies, um, Pat Cool had shown this as well, that they uh, had constancy across indexical features so that they could recognize a ba and Ray's voice and Dan Isabel's voice as the, as the same sound. So we focused on the nature of phonetic discrimination, and that's really been the focus of a lot of my career and continues to be in a lot of ways. And so one of the first questions we asked was, well, one of the questions we asked, not maybe one of the first ones, 
um, was whether it's just discrimination of individual exemplars or whether these are categories. And so the way that we asked that, we tested um, infants, uh, young infants, um, and we tested them in a conditioned head turn procedure. And we created a continuum of sounds that went from the English ba to the English da, through the Hindi dental da and the Hindi retroflex da, which you all hear is da, we'll talk about that more later. And we gave infants, we, so there are three categories here, and we gave infants multiple exemplars that either crossed a category boundary um, and found that yes, they could discriminate that, the English category boundary and the Hindi category boundary, and yes, they could discriminate that, or multiple exemplars from within a category that were equally different, and that they failed to discriminate. And so this was one of the earliest, and still one of the few demonstrations in the literature that these aren't just like individual discrimination points, but that there are actually, there's um, variability within a category that represent. Um, <clears throat> we also were interested in, and I continue to be, whether these representations are auditory only or multisensory. And building again on some work Pat Cool had done, we showed that as young as two months, babies can do bimodal speech matching. So if they see one person going, another going, and they hear ooh or ee, they'll look to the side that matches. And uh, more recently, we've shown that this interacts with or baby's own oral motor movement. So this was work that Henny Jung introduced to the lab. So if you put um, a finger in a baby's mouth, so they're pursing their lips like in boo, or stretch their lips with a teething toy that makes it into an E form, E, if there's a match between the lips and the sound they're hearing, babies actually look to the contrasting side. If it doesn't match, they don't pay any attention to what's in their, in their mouth. Um, so they can do it without, with nothing in their mouth. If it doesn't match, it doesn't interfere. But if it matches, it interferes. And we went on to explore this and found that motor babies' own oral motor movements, impeding them, interfering with them, actually um, interferes with auditory-only speech perception well. And again, we used uh, an experimentally impeded tongue movement. That in the dental da versus retroflex da is produced with the tongue in these two positions. Again, you can't hear that difference, but little babies can. And so we had babies sit on mom's lap. We had them discriminate these two sounds with nothing in their mouth. And then we had mom either hold a flat teether in their mouth that prevented the tongue movement. So it went in about this far. They just held it in a little bit or a gummy teether um, in their mouth that just went up against their gums and didn't interfere with the tongue tip movement. We used an alternating, non-alternating task. And what we found is that with nothing in their mouth, they discriminated the difference. Uh, with the gummy teether in their mouth that didn't interfere with the movement, they discriminated the difference. But with the flat teether, they did not. And so this suggests that they're getting feedback from their own oral motor and attempting perhaps to match and when they can't that it interferes. Now, obviously this is like, yeah, really? And one of the people who was really criticizing this in Twitter, which I don't read, but my students <laughs> kept telling me about, um, was Greg Hickok, who's um, an editor at Psychonomic Science and Review. So I invited him to come visit. And uh, he did, and he said, well, I mean, I thought you were sticking that flat teether all the way down their throat, and uh, my goodness, it is hard to test babies. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, why don't you, well, we were already thinking, we were actually already designed, he said, why don't you do a replication and submit it to me as a pre-registered replication before you complete the data? And so we did that. And um, it had to go through a few reviews, a few, I mean, a few rounds of revisions as a pre-registered replication. Um, and then it got accepted. And we actually have one more baby in each group to test. But these are the results with 23 of 24 babies in each group. The original finding, these are synthetic rather than natural stimuli, we've replicated for the, the flat teether interfering with the da-da discrimination. And then we asked whether this same gummy teeter that didn't interfere with da-da 
would interfere with something that involves the lips. So we tested babies on Bada, and we didn't know if this would work because it's native. They're really familiar with it. Um, and um, <coughs> it only interferes with Fa, not Da, not both of them like it did with the other one. But as you can see, it did interfere. This time we have discrimination for a non-alternating, rather than alternating, um, showing a non-alternating preference. And we could talk about that afterwards. This happens in it, but research. And, uh, but we think we're showing the specificity of the effect um, on the articulator that's involved in the discrimination. So we've been, been interested then in the nature of the representation. And we've also been interested in becoming a native listener. So how do babies attune to the phonetic properties of the native language? I promise I'll get back to Peter. This is the longest part of my work. And this is work we did a long time ago. I've got a lot of old work in here because we lost Peter in 2001. And so this is when we asked about this Hindi retroflex dental distinction, da da, that you have difficulty discriminating, and indeed you do, but Hindi adults find it super easy, just like you do da da. And what we found is that this change occurs in the first year of life. So young English learning babies can discriminate this difference, so they're born with those kinds of categorical like discrimination abilities that Peter Jukic first identified, and their language universal. There were some follow-ups to his work um, that showed that, and Lynn Streeter and uh, Sandra Treya, and the change from language universal to language specific happens in the first year of life. By 10 to 12 months, English learning infants are no longer discriminating this, but Hindi learning infants maintain it. And as shown in subsequent work, at Cool's lab, and then the polkas, it gets even sharper. And we extended and replicated this a lot with a lot of different methods. Bilingual learning babies maintain the distinctions used in both of their languages, so as they should. Now, it's also been shown that um, there's perceptual attunement to auditory visual matching. So this work was done um, in Barcelona. Um, and what they found is that, so Spanish doesn't have a ba-ba distinction, but young Spanish learning babies can visually match ba-sa, just like English, like, like everybody can, me, who. Um, but by the time they're 11 months, they've stopped discriminating it, and they also can no longer match, which would make sense. And lots of us have done follow-ups to this. We've done it with our Hindi retro. Now what Peter asked is not about attunement or becoming a native listener to the phonetic distinctions of the native language, but to many, many other properties. So I'm going to talk about five areas in which he did work. Other rhythmical characteristics of languages, stress patterns, phonotactics, intonation, and clause and phrase boundaries. So to start with the rhythmical characteristics. So you're not all linguists. You don't all study language. Um, the, la the, the, the languages of the world differ in rhythmical properties. Um, so if I say a sentence, I don't know why this sentence just came into my head um, from a children's song. I went to the animal fair. You hear da 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 da. da. So you hear alternating stress. Um, if I were to translate that into French, it would sound to you like da 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 da. So where each syllable is equal um, stress, and clauses and phrases and sentences are marked by declination. But you don't have stress differences um, at the word level. And if I were to speak it in Japanese with more, it would sound faster than I can produce anymore, like da 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 da. Um, and so there's that rhythmical characteristic. And so the first question that um, Peter, in collaboration with Jacques Mailer, um, and this was very much conceived together, um, it was a coin toss for who got to be first author, asked whether babies were sensitive to these rhythmical differences across the world's languages. And what they found is that babies could discriminate, can discriminate languages from different rhythmical classes. So even if you low pass filter it, there were probably close to 60 studies after this initial one. Uh, they can discriminate on the basis of these rhythmical characteristics. But already, as newborns, they prefer listening to languages with their native rhythm. 
Um, so, um, and um, other groups, Moon and Pfeiffer, have followed up on this. Um, but it's the rhythmical characteristics that they're establishing as the basis of their native language. And by five months, they can discriminate their own language. Again, if you filter it so you remove the phonetic content from another language within the same rhythmical class. So if you're growing up English, you can discriminate English and German, but you can't necessarily discriminate German um, from French um, until you get a little bit older. So it has to be native language from another language within the, I'm sorry, German and French are different <coughs> classes. You can't discriminate German from Dutch, two languages from within the same rhythmical class. Now this work launched an entire line of work, not just looking to see how far this generalized, but asking whether rhythmical and other prosodic properties bootstrap acquisition of syntax. And there is an enormous amount of work that indicates that they do, that there's a relationship between the surface the, 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 um, rhythm and the word order of the language. Uh, that the basic word order, word order uh, level, subject verb object versus subject object verb, and in other cases at finer uh, distinctions in word order within languages. So babies might be getting a leg up into the word order through these rhythmical properties. And Peter was involved in a lot of that work as well. So the, we've, we've also been involved in some of this work. One of the studies that we did is we asked about preference and discrimination in babies who had, uh, who were exposed to two languages in utero. So we started with the Filipino community in Vancouver, because everybody's bilingual in English and Tagalog, whether they live in Vancouver or the Philippines, and speaking both languages throughout um, their pregnancies. And, it, and rhythm is something that very much gets across the uterine wall. And what we found, first of all, this is taught in preference for Tagalog on top and preference for English on the bottom, is that monolingual learning English, monolingual newborn infants, um, prefer listening to English. So that replicates what other people have shown. Our Tagalog English bilingual exposed infants were all over the place. There was no clear preference, and we couldn't relate these values to the amount that their mother spoke each language. Perhaps if we had a bigger sample, we would be able to. Um, and we also tested Chinese English bilingual learning infants on these same stimuli, because Tagalog is from the same rhythmical class as Chinese, um, Mandarin, and Cantonese. And what we found is they also didn't show preference for either. They didn't show preference for Tagalog over English, even though English is familiar to them. But yet they were statistically different than the Tagalog bilingual sample. So maybe there's something in there that babies who are bilingual um, exposed to two languages in utero, even from two different rhythmical classes, maybe they're paying attention to rhythm. And there's some evidence of discriminating within rhythmic class, but this is not a strong one. Then we ask, well, what has happened? If bilingual babies are not showing a preference for either of their native languages, is it because they're recognizing both as familiar, or is it because they just have mixed all their languages? So we did a discrimination study using a high amplitude sucking procedure. And these are the blue line is the English babies. This is the final habituation. And these are the two habitu dishabituation minutes. And as you can see, the monolingual babies showed a significant recovery from habituation. The bilingual English Tagalog learning newborns showed significant discrimination. And this is our control condition. It looks like there's a blip at one minute. But when you, you have to sum across the two minutes, there's, there wasn't significant discrimination. So what this indicates is then, there shouldn't have been, so it didn't change, is that <coughs> even though they're hearing two languages in utero and they don't, pre they don't prefer one over the other, they can nonetheless still use that cue to rhythmicity to keep them apart. And we've interpreted this as suggesting that from the moment they're born, a baby who's been exposed to two languages in utero already knows something about them and perhaps something really fundamental to bootstrapping syntax and can use that, perhaps, as one of the cues to help keep their languages apart as they move on in acquisition. Um, we've also shown that babies can discriminate languages just by watching silent talking faces. 
So we basically filmed these three English, French bilingual speakers reciting sentences from the little prints in either English or in French, and then we turned the sound off. And we habituated babies to uh, videos, silent videos of them speaking in one language um, or the other. And when their looking time declined, we presented either um, new samples from the old language, so that's a control condition, or new samples from the other language. And what we found is that <coughs> monolingual learning infants could discriminate the change at four months and at six months, but no longer at eight months. So they seem to be born with sensitivity to characteristics and talking faces that distinguish one language from another. Now there would be a lot of rhythmical information there, but there's also phonetic information. So, and other things. Um, but they, we showed attunement here as well, where but when we tested the babies who were growing up with French and English, they maintained the sensitivity. Now, I thought, I argued that it was specific perceptual attunement. They learned the properties of each of their languages. They're maintaining it. My close friend and colleague, Mary Sebastian Gallus, um, Alfredo Fabra in uh, Barcelona said, no, Janet, it's not just that. It's because they're bilinguals and bilingual babies. She was already putting forward the hypothesis. really like looking at faces. They pay a lot of attention to talking faces. So we tested Spanish Catalan learning babies in Barcelona on the English French visual language samples. And they discriminated um, at eight months, even when our, and the monolingual Spanish and the monolingual Catalan babies failed. So there may be an attentional boost there for bilingual babies, or it may be that it's an attentional boost that's specific to the way they track faces because there, as I mentioned, there's a growing body of research indicating that they really look at your face when you're talking. Okay, so that was the rhythmical properties that uh, Peter studied and the influence on my work. He also looked at how babies attune to the stress patterns, all these other characteristics I mentioned. So, and the way he did this is that he took a procedure that was out there a little bit in Anne Bernal's lab. And again, um, he made it into a standard procedure that's um, now used across many infant labs. And in fact, there's just a, you know, we're all suffering through the replicability crisis. These sample sizes in some of these papers, even from seven, eight years ago, I would never try to publish with today. But part of what's going on in the infant world is that, um, Mike Frank at Stanford is um, is leading uh, a many babies study where we do replications of things across different labs, and one of the one of the findings, and they've been doing meta analyses of all si of all kinds, and one of the findings that's come out of all this work is that this head turn preference procedure that Peter um, standardized is one of the mo most robust procedures we have in the infant world. Um, so just remember that. Okay, and basically what happens in the, in the head turn preference procedure is baby sits on mom's lap or whoever's lap and parents wearing headphones so that they can't hear what the baby's hearing and the baby is either just tested in a preference procedure so a light comes on, they turn their head to um, see the light and they'll hear sounds of one type and then on some trials, the light comes on on the other side, um, and they hear sounds of another type. Now they've found that they don't have to vary it side by side, just the light comes on, and how long do they look to a flashing light when they're hearing sounds of a particular type? Or you can do a learning phase where you pre-expose them for two, three, four minutes to like an artificial grammar or a background language or sentences, whatever you want. Um, you, until they accumulate um, this X amount of time of listening, and then you test on preference in the test phase. So he, um, he introduced this, um, standardized it for the field. Um, and I'm going to use this little cartoon because it's not as distracting, and because we don't sit uh, behind anymore <laughs> measuring, you know, everything's over closed circuit TV, et cetera. 
um, and ask these kinds of questions. So one of the first questions that they asked was whether babies were sensitive to word level stress. Um, and so this is, um, so things like he, they familiarized, this was a series of I think six experiments in this paper. Um, he always had replications and control conditions and papers, so I think he would have understood the replicability crisis pretty well. Uh, but this is an example of a kinds of lists of words babies might hear. Strong weak is the standard in English. Um, I'm Janet, I'm not Jeanette. Um, and so they heard unfamiliar words um, like pliant, falter, donor, comet. These are strong weak. Or unfamiliar weak strong words, which as I said are much less frequent in English. Comply, befall, condone, report, etc. And they asked whether babies would listen longer in this head turn preference procedure to one stress pattern or the other. And what they found is that um, by nine months, but not six months, babies have become familiar with the stress pattern of their native language. And so this is, and then the, this, they tested both English and, um, oh no, sorry, yeah. Um, and they still found this when they low pass filtered, so da 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 versus da 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 is what babies like. Um, and so they are sensitive to that by nine months. They also looked at phonotactics. So phonotactics are the sequences of sounds um, that are allowable within a language. So for example, in English, we allow consonant sequences like STR, so we have the word string. But we don't allow RST at the beginning of a word. We only allow it at the end of a word, like in burst. And languages have different rules about phonotactics. Uh, and so they tested babies on uh, sets of words that corresponded to acceptable or not acceptable phonotactic patterns in their native language. Then again, there were eight experiments, I think, in this paper. Um, and what they found is that, again, here this was at, again, nine months, but not six months. Um, babies show a preference and stress Anyway, for phonotactics, it was nine months. So English learning babies prefer listening to words, again, unfamiliar words that conform to the phonotactic um, rules of the native language. And with the same lists of words, Dutch learning babies prefer listening to the Dutch words. So they pulled out the phonotactic. Um, and they also did this with uh, intonation, where they tested like English and Norwegian, because Norwegian has different pitch patterns. And with, with the intonation differences, babies could had learned this about their native language earlier by six months of age. So they're becoming native listeners to all these characteristics. You'll see in a moment why this is important. Uh, they also, by again nine months, they could distinguish um, like connected speech where pauses were inserted at phrase boundaries, but not within a phrase. So they're learning about the, the prosody, the rhythm, of uh, the syntax of the phrasal characteristics in their native language as well. So they're picking up so much. Um, and we'll see in a moment why this is so important. But another digression, because I want to share some of my own work. So while he was going on and trying to understand how babies become native listeners to so many other properties of the native language. I'm still here focused on um, phonetic perception and increasingly rhythmical as well, because I think those are more, anyway, they're different. They're, and we'll see how they're different. So I asked, I started asking then, what is the underlying neurobiology of how experience changes the speech perception? So one question we ask, is it just amount of exposure? And um, some of Peter's work with phonotactics showed that it wasn't just the acceptable phonotactic uh, sequences, but in fact the most common ones that infants preferred the most. So they were learning, if they were learning rules, it was through frequency. 
Um, so we asked, well, is our babies attuning to their native language phonetic categories? Did they stop discriminating that in the erector plex dental because of amount of exposure, or are there are there biological maturational limits on the system? And so we partnered with um, Marcella Pina and Jislyn Dahan. Marcella had already done this kind of work with rhythm perception, so it was really building on her work, and asked whether premature exposure, babies who were born uh, about 12 weeks premature, would go through perceptual attunement at an earlier age, because they had had earlier experience. And this time we used um, a mismatch response, an ERP response, rather than a behavioral response. And what we found is there seems to be gating by maturation. So the babies who were um, at nine months, the typically the full-term babies could discriminate and no longer did at 12 months. And what we found is that the babies who were born premature at 12 months post-birth, but of course only nine months gestational age, were still discriminating distinctions and didn't stop discriminating until closer to 15 months gestational, I mean gestational age, um, 15 months post-birth, which made them the same as 12 months gestational age. Um, so this seems to be gated by maturation. Follow-up work, um, well it's actually published the same year, in Thierry Nazi's lab showed that this isn't the case for phonotactics. So learning that STR is the acceptable at the beginning of a word in your native language is accelerated by premature experience. So some things seem to be driven maybe more by just amount of input uh, than other things. I think the amount of input is important in both cases, but in some cases there, there seem to be uh, uh, biological limits on when the system opens to that kind of frequency experience. So this is something that we've gone on and asked about. Is the timing of phonetic perception controlled by critical period mechanisms? And this is work that I have been doing in collaboration with Cal Hinch, who studies circuit properties in uh, the visual system uh, in little mice. And he's also started looking at auditory um, properties as well. And um, in his lab, he's, um, uh, he's, he's found a, a set of circuits, some parvel human cells, a class of inner neurons that are GABA modulated that, that seem to basically open and close plasticity. And the way that he understands it is the brain is trying to learn all the time, but there are these molecular breaks that are laid down by the balance of inhibition and excitation in this class of cells, of, of cells that prevent the brain from learning until it gets into this plastic period and a different class of molecular breaks that are put down at the end of it that make it harder for it to learn again. And we call these critical periods because there is a biological mechanism. And understanding that mechanism, it's also though possible to lift the breaks. So if you get into these same circuits uh, with neuromodulators, serotonin turns out to be one, or types of experience that get in there, you can change the properties so these breaks are lifted. So it's really kind of interesting. So we, we try to, he does like his like, amazing work, and I look for human populations that can test um, some of these questions. So we looked at, um, as I mentioned, SRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which you know primarily affect uh, the serotonin uh, circuits have a secondary pathway that appears to get into um, these parvel human cells. So you can see those you're interested by HT going in there. So we tested babies who were exposed to these chemicals in utero from their moms taking antidepressants. Um, now we also tested babies of the moms who were experiencing depression, because depression is like, unfortunately, not uncommon uh, during pregnancy and the postnatal period, but this was during pregnancy, who had chosen with their doctors not to take SRIs, because they're also 
pharmacological effects on the system just from depression. Um, and we tested them as newborns at six months and at 10 months. Um, and we tested them both on a speech perception dis discrimination at six and 10 months. It was the handy dental retroflex and on this visual language discrimination. And I'm not gonna go through all those data, but basically what we found is that uh, the babies who had been exposed to SRIs in utero were accelerated in speech perception development. So they had open plasticity and they had stopped discriminating these non-native distinctions at an earlier age than you would have predicted. Mm -hmm. And they did the same thing for visual language. Um, we, we, can get, we inferred that. We did, they had stopped discriminating by six months. They were discriminating things they shouldn't have been discriminating as newborns. Um, and the babies whose moms were, that was group three, the babies whose moms were experiencing prenatal depression and who had chosen not to have SRIs were actually slower, so they were still discriminating both the phonetic difference and the visual language difference at uh, 10 months, 12 months, uh, 10 months, sorry. So we don't know if this has any consequences. So you think, oh, if you're doing something earlier, that's good. Well, earlier isn't necessarily good because your speech perception categories are being attuned as a function of exposure to your native language. And if you haven't gotten enough native language, you might end up, you know, you could presumably, you could end up with a set of categories that don't match that well and won't be that useful when you go on to map sounds to letters when you're learning how to read, et cetera. But on the other hand, maybe it is good if the whole system is accelerated. Something being a little bit later isn't necessarily bad if the whole system is developing more slowly which it might be postnatally if mom isn't interacting as much because she's still experiencing depression. So, so we don't know. So we're finally, finally testing these kids again. They're 10 years old now. Um, and Tim Oberlander, my colleague in Vancouver who does the work on maternal depression, is bringing the cohort back and we've started testing them again on some homological awareness um, uh, tasks. Um, and word segmenting, et cetera. So we'll see. And we have reading scores and all that. Okay. So that's what we did. We've been looking at the neurobiology, and we're still very interested in that. Now, Peter is interested in words. And so he did a lot of work on segmenting and representing words, which is really important. So we already heard about his work on showing we prefer listening to native words that have a native language stress pattern, the phonotactics, intonation, et cetera. But the problem he was really trying to get at, and he had to work a little bit harder to find another procedure, or use the same procedure, but to ask the question differently, is word segmentation. So when you hear me talking, you hear the words as separate. But if I were to show you an acoustic waveform, there are no blank spaces between words. They run into another. They have to for motor planning, for articulation, et cetera. And like when I listen to French, I can't find the word boundaries. I don't know about you. When any of you listen to Japanese, unless you're really fluent speakers, it's hard to find the syllable boundaries, even though it's a syllable-based language. Um, so a young baby can't find those word boundaries. How are they going to go about learning words if they can't pull them out of ongoing speech? We don't spend a lot of time saying, up, up. So <laughs> we don't do that. So he was very interested in that problem. So in 1995, he and Dick Aslan uh, joined up and asked whether and what age infants can segment, represent, and recognize words from continuous speech. So can they pull them out? And how detailed are those representations? Again, they used the head turn preference procedure, but this time they pre-familiarized them. So babies, I don't know if you can read those words, but babies either heard like cup dog passages. The cup was bright and shiny. A clown drank from the red cup. The other one picked up the big cup. His cup was filled with milk, et cetera. So they either heard cup dog passages or they heard bike feet passages. And then they asked them, they tested babies, so they heard those first in this head turn preference procedure. Um, and then, where they, I think they accumulated two and a half minutes of listening time. 
And then they tested them on their preference for listening to the words cup and dog, or feet and bike. And what they found is that um, infants succeeded in pulling these words out at seven and a half, but not six months of age. So by seven and a half months, they can segment words from continuous speech. And they did it the other direction as well. They pre-familiarized them to the words alone and then tested them on the passages. So Peter Juzik didn't coin the phrase statistical learning. But what his work did is it provided fertile ground for statistical learning. So he had, um, you know, he had already shown that it was frequency, not just phonotactic rules, that influenced the baby's recognition of familiar words, and they did the same thing in word segmentation. And then here they had shown that, you know, how important uh, that babies can segment words by seven and a half months. And it provided, you know, the scientific <coughs> backdrop that allowed Saffron Aslan and Newport, and again, she was an undergrad when she published this paper, um, to show that babies could use just statistics alone to segment words. So if you think about the phrases, pretty baby, my little baby, look at the baby over there, they always goes with B. And so can babies track those Transitional probabilities between uh, between word between syllables to pull out words, and they did an artificial learning language learning task. And yes, they could. Yes, they can. Um, and this was also like just like hugely influential. Um, and like many others, we also then started asking about the role of statistics. Uh, so we asked about whether statistical learning would be one of the mechanisms by which, when the brain is open and ready for it, uh, babies attune their phonetic categories to native language. So if you think about it, I don't know if that's big enough for you to see, a baby who's growing up in English hears only one D in kind of unimodal distribution. If we say, look at the doll, that's my doll, do you want to play with our dolls? All the dolls are pretty today. The D is different in each of those pronunciations. It's, a, it's influenced our doll, it's further back D than with dolls, it's front D. Um, so it's more like a dental and a rectorflex there, but it's all in a unimodal type distribution where the middle of the category is likely what a baby hears the most. A baby growing up in Hindi, there are two different words there. One is for lentils a dental doll, and the other is for branch. So they distinguish this in their native language. So babies growing up in Hindi probably hear, in fact, we did publish some other work that shows they do hear, bimodal distributions of these sounds. And so we asked, we designed, this was Jessica May, came to the lab from Luan Birkin's lab, where they had done this with adults, and asked whether babies could track these kinds of statistical cues. So we made, we basically, uh, made a continuum, and we did this with voicing first, and then we did it with our retroflex dental. And we asked, um, we didn't present the words along a continuum, but babies would hear like 96 words four different times, 96 syllables, that in which there were um, eight times as many uh, of these two DAWs at bimodal peaks, or eight times as many of these two DAWs in the middle of a but in random order. And we asked whether this kind of pre-exposure changed discrimination. And we found that at six to eight months, it did. So at six to eight months, babies who were given a bimodal distribution were better able to discriminate. We asked the endpoints then, one versus eight, that they had all heard the same number of tokens of in each condition. So they were better able to discriminate those endpoints than were babies in the unimodal condition. So we thought, OK, tracking frequency might be one of the means by which babies learn their native language phonetic categories. Works well at six to eight months. Not as well at 10 months. It still does. But it seems that you have to have either social cues, some of Pat Cool's work, or referential cues, word meaning, to when they're, when they're like not really doing very good anymore. They're starting to lose this at nine to 10 months to maintain it 
the statistical learning can get in there, but it's probably not the most effective. In any event, we did that. Okay, now Peter, this came, you know, this 1996, Saffron Aslan and Newport published. Peter had been looking at preference, segmentation, etc., and he acknowledged, and he had actually been talking about frequency, but he hadn't done this. He acknowledged and measured statistics, but he also continued to focus on how infants use language-specific properties for word segmentation. And he found that by 10 to 12 months, they use, um, they use position-specific phonetic cues, they use phonotactics. So if a baby, no other information, no transitional probabilities, but there's an STR string, I mean, letters together, they're like, that's a word boundary, that's the beginning of a word. There's an RST, they're like, oh, a word just ended there. So they're using that to segment words. And again, as I mentioned, driven by frequency, they can segment by seven and a half months, strong, weak words. So they could pull out a doctor from passages of speech that had um, a doctor in it, Hamlet, but they couldn't pull out guitar. They can't pull out guitar and device these weak strong, just like you saw with preference, until they're like 10 and a half months old. And in fact, if, you saw, if there were regularities, the guitar is on the chair, <coughs> the guitar is in the car, his guitar is out of tune, they, they segmented it uh, from the strong to the weak syllable. They pull out the word tar is. But by 10 and a half months, they had enough experience, enough knowledge of the native language, using, putting together probably phonotactic, transitional probability, all sorts of cues, and they could do, they can do strong, weak strong as well. So the debate still continues though, statistics or phonological cues, which comes first. And Saffron, Aslan, and Newport and others have claimed that statistics come first, they argue that it's those transitional probabilities that allow babies to pull out words like baby, and then that allows them to learn the position-specific phonetic properties, the phonotactics, the stress, et cetera. Whereas others, Peter, Elizabeth Dodson, uh, many others um, argue, no, they have to have learned the phonotactic prop, the, 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 the language-specific properties first, because how will they know that they is even a syllable? if they don't know what a syllable looks like in English. Um, and so they did a study where they pitted them against one another and they found that language specific stress, this is at seven and a half months, wins over statistics. But the debate's gone back and forth. They've done it with co-articulation, so have others. Um, we think um, that they use both, depending on which is, that's supposed to say, the most informative. And so this is work that I did with Judith Gervain when she came to the lab. That's Judith as a postdoc, and it built on work she had done where she had shown that in parsing out phrases, babies can use frequency. So if they grow up in a language like English that is um, that has prepositional phrases and that has so like with, from, those come before the noun, for the content in the phrase. Um, and we have determiners like the, and that, bec that come before the noun. That they use, those are highly frequent little words that they can use frequency to pull words out. Languages that are subject, object, verb tend to have post positions. So the Tokyo kara, so rather than from Tokyo, it's Tokyo kara. Determiners come after the noun. And those babies expect the noun to be so anyway, they use frequency. But we studied babies who were growing up bilingual in languages that have opposite word orders and where frequency alone wouldn't get you there. And we found that they used the native language prosody. And so it's duration in English, it's pitch in languages that have the opposite word order like Japanese and Hindi. Um, and so babies seem to, our work would suggest that they can use either cue. This is at the phrase level rather than the word level. But that they're open. Um, and they're probably pulling it all together and using all of them, depending upon what is most informative in a minute. Okay. 
I just wanted to point out that to do this study, it's one of many where we've used the head turn preference procedure. That's Peter. That's when he was in Japan teaching Reiko Mazuka how to set up the head turn preference procedure in her lab because he was concerned about replication. He always got preference for familiarity in his lab. Dick Aslan always got preference for novelty in his lab. The two of them never figured it out. Dick got an, uh, and Dick and Jock Mailer got a grant from the McDonald Foundation that I was part of for nine years to try to figure out when we get novelty and when we get familiarity preferences with infants, and we never figured it out. But in any event, Peter went around the world with people who wanted to set up the head turn preference procedure to make sure that they got it set up right. So, uh, and this was when he was in Japan helping Reiko, Ma Reiko Mazuka, who's at the Rikin, still at his Brain Science Institute. And I'm showing you this because this is the booth we have in our lab. She had two booths that he helped her set up. And then when my lab started wanting to use the head turn preference procedure, Reiko said, you know, I'm doing a lot of neuroimaging now as well. I don't need two of these booths anymore. Do you want one? So we took it. And we still have it now. We don't have you know, the little contraption behind where they're looking in anymore and all that sort of stuff. But we still have the pegboards, and we still have the lights. Um, so thanks, Peter. OK. Now, well, a couple more segues. Uh, I'm, I'm supposed to end. So I, I'll just jump through <laughs> and just say I'm not going to go through this. He studied babies have um, full phonetic representation. So when they could segment words at seven and a half word months, they got it right. If they pulled out cup, they didn't confuse it with tuck. We spent 10 years seeing what happens in word learning. And they have more difficulty in word learning. OK. And they do it with auditory visual. There you go. OK. Then the last thing I want to say is that Peter's work also made a contribution to the foundations of understanding not just recognizing word forms and pulling them out, but understanding word meaning. So. The classic view is that, you know, maybe babies, maybe they know they recognize mama, maybe not when they're really young, but that they really start understanding words probably around nine, ten months, and that they build from that. And he really did overturn that. So um, he showed, first of all, that they show preference for listening to their own names by as early as four and a half months. Um, and that's just the word form, though, again. And then the first inklings came in this study that was published by one of his students, Ruth Tinkoff and Peter, in uh, Psych Science in 1999, where he sh they showed that babies at six months seemed to show some level of comprehension of mommy and daddy. So if they saw these two photos, which happened to be previous students of mine, um, and one is their mother and one is their father, and they hear mommy, they look to the correct one. They hear daddy, they look to the correct one. They see another baby's mommy and daddy. They don't do that at six months. And they do this, uh, they also recognize their mother over an unfamiliar female, somebody else's <coughs> mom. And this sat in the literature. And there was another paper by Tinkoff and Juzik where they looked at um, really common words. It didn't get published for a long time. Because then what happened is this finding was rediscovered by Alec Bergelson and Dan Swingley um, in 2012. And then the other publication came out in Tinkoff and Juzy. That at six months, babies, by six months, babies seem to be recognizing and showing preferential looking to the match at the beginnings of contribution, of, of comprehension of words like feet and hands and cup and bottle and some really common words. Not every baby knows all of them, but every baby at six months seems to know some of them. And this has, like, this is just taking off again. So Tuesday, I was committee member on a thesis defense in my department. And somebody's, you know, looking at this. Is it just proper names? No, obviously not. Is it count nouns as well, like names for classes of objects? How detailed is it? How specific, et cetera? So this is a legacy that is only now gathering traction. And it's also influencing my and many other people's views on how phonetic categories are established. 
So yeah, distributional learning statistics, babies can track those. But the other thing that happens when they hear different sounds is that they're paired with different objects. And what we're finding, and again, this is in a young led a lot of this work, is that it's a, it's a consistent pairing by nine to 10 months of a sound form with an object that helps pull and keep those phonetic categories distinct. So what this suggests then is the way that I've always talked about my work up until very recently is that babies establish their native phonetic categories, their native phonetic cactus, their blah, 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 and they use those to guide word learning, and, but perhaps they're developing in tandem. Uh, and that words are special, they guide phonetic learning, phonetic learning guides word learning from early on. So very quickly, some legacy contributions. RAPSA is here's the model that he had, word recognition and phonetic structure acquisition. It didn't have word meaning in it. I wish that he could have done another iteration as he understood that comprehension was there earlier and I would have loved to have seen what it was. It made all of us really have to formalize what our thinking was. We developed primer at that time. Um, we'll go through that. His discovery of spoken language, this book is just a joy to read and a must read for anyone in the field. Um, he also established, I mean, he had been working toward establishing a Society for Language Development and his journal Language Learning and Development before he died and that was continued and we have that journal um, which is where my primer paper was first published. And that's where, if these vectors get written up, that they will be published, I think. Um, so that's a legacy. And, and in that spirit, we've started uh, the language sciences at UBC. So thanks to my funders, to my lab, my collaborators, and especially to Peter. Before you clap, let me show you why I have this picture. This is Peter when he visited us with Josie Ann Bertoncini. If you're in the speech perception field, you know her. She was at um, the same lab for many years that Jacques Naylor was at. She was his student and an uh, investigator there. And we went to Whistler. Peter went skiing. Josie Ann's holding his poles. When Peter went skiing, Anne Marie, his wife, told me that well, he fell. He just, he had only skied, I don't know if he'd skied before, he had only a few times. And we went to Whistler, which is a difficult mount. He fell all the time. Just get back up. Wanted to keep going. So we did the green runs, the easy runs. And he said, okay, I'm ready to do the blue run. Peter, you're still falling on the green runs. No. So we did the blue runs, the middle runs. And you know, he's falling all the time. He got a little better. But then he's like, I want to do the black runs, the hard runs. And so Anne-Marie said it was over two months before the bruises went away. <laughs> but that was Peter. You know, he just threw himself into everything. Um, and he did master skiing a lot faster than most people. <laughs> 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 time for questions? Just raise your hand. Yeah. So, uh, this is about the work with the preemies. Yeah. So, was this work based on visual discrimination or auditory? Ours was based on auditory. Uh, well, no, um, yeah, the, the, vis the premise was just auditory discrimination. There is other work with visual discrimination. Um, it hasn't, they haven't looked at everything. But the things that they've looked at, and it's not in the language domain, um, and I, I suggest that that is like phonotactics, that earlier experience accelerates development. But I don't know if it would. We haven't done it for visual speech. Because is it, isn't sound getting through through the user? Yes, form? sound is getting through. So I think that's a really important question. So the first study that Marcella Pinion uh, did was on the rhythmical characteristics. And everybody criticized that because the rhythmical characteristics get through, definitely yeah. get through. But it's still not necessarily the case that the brain can respond to it. Right. And so my sense is that it's these aspects of language that are the most formal, mm -hmm. like, like phonetics which, and like syntax, that there may be critical periods or something like critical periods for. Mm -hmm. um, so, but for phonetics, the, it's unlikely that the characteristics that distinguish a retrofessor dental D, it's a format transition, would get through. Right. But, yeah. 
but it's, yeah. Come on. <laughs> this is the fun part. You may think it's a bad question, just throw me a question. Yes? Um, I know you talked about some of this work looking at word um, segmentation mm -hmm. in speech. Um, has there been any work looking at sort of words within words, so like morphemes, morpheme discrimination? So, um, I'm going to give you two answers to that. So the first one is that if you think about a lot of the statistical learning work, where um, I can just go back to that. Um, I turned off the um, Where you have these sets of syllables that are, you don't know whether those are words or morphemes. So if we look at this, uh, we don't know what they are. We don't know if they're words or morphemes or sentences. Or um, so it could be that this is a sequence of morphemes. Um, this mm -hmm. um, go. So. Bolabu uh, mm -hmm. is treated as a word. It could be three morphemes. Uh, there is work that's being done now on how, how, which parts of this babies are pulling out. Do they do better with the, the first syllable, the medial mm -hmm. syllable? Do they do the first and second together? And one could re-discuss that work or redesign it slightly differently so that you actually were, were looking at morphemes. But I don't think they have looked at it that way. The other, the other um, relevant answer to that question is that they have also looked at cues to um, internal versus crossword boundaries, so like nitrate versus nitrate, and Peter was part of that as well, and babies seem to be very sensitive to those. So if you put those two approaches together, I think you could look at marketing, so that'd be really interesting. I'm trying to think if there's stuff on stems, and there might be, but I can't recall it right now. If I just follow up um, to tie into your work, looking at early infant uh, phonetic discrimination, is that a skill that sort of directly predicts later word segmentation, or is it much more complicated? So it, that's, that's a great question. It, it predicts later vocabulary size, um, and it's, um, but I don't, I'm just trying to remember what Rich Rochelle Newman did. I don't think she looked at phonetic discrimination predicting. I don't think people have looked at that specific question. But that's a great question. Yeah. That's my question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I go with it. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that uh, you were just about to be testing the 10 year olds who were right. in the study with the depressed moms. Uh, what are your predictions for that? Oh, well, my hope is that there's no difference. Um, but I think it's important to see if there is. So we know that there are relations between a history of mental ear infection where you're not getting um, lots of babies have mental ear infections, and there are, and again, this is a messy literature, but one were to look across the literature, there are many studies that indicate for some babies there is a relation between multiple mental ear infections and later reading and spelling difficulties. For those babies where there isn't, I'm wondering if the moms get in there and get the visual information. Um, so if you don't have high quality input then when the system is reorganizing, um, there that's a kind of proof of concept that there could be later difficulties. And if, um, uh, so I guess that, and if there are, I guess, on the other hand, there is some protection, you know, in neural maturation for when the circuits are, are ready. Um, my sense is that, except the SRI opens them soon. My sense is that, my prediction is that the babies of depressed moms for, for whom did not have SRIs, for everything was happening later, 
that, that they're going to be fine. Um, they were getting less on their vocal, getting less on if their mom gets over depression, because they get less input all together, so their vocabulary is less contingent input, the vocabularies are lower. But if their mom gets over it, the SRI, where, they're, where it's accelerated, um, that's where I think there might be subtle differences. That's an accelerated critical period. It's an accelerated yeah, critical hard, period. Yeah. yeah. So, but I, I hope not. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be such a small signal that we're looking at not just the babies who were in our group when they were infants, but a couple of cohorts that are going through Tim's lab that we didn't test when they were infants as well. But, um, yeah. And it's not that, I mean, it's, I hate, I, I, it's a really, depression is physiologic, you know, mater it's, it's physiologically and culturally and I mean, it, it comes for all these reasons, maternal depression. And it's bad enough to be depressed and it's even worse to think that there might be consequences from whatever decision yeah. you make. Um, so um, I think pe people are making the best decisions that they can. We also know um, different antidepressants probably work differently for different people. But um, so I don't want to make you know people feel any worse. On the other hand, it's best to have as much information as you possibly can. Um, and well, it might now, affect your choice of drug. It might affect your choice of drug. That's right. Or your just your choice of treatment. Um, so, yeah. But we know that maternal depression is not good for kids. Period. Mm -hmm. So you want to do whatever you can about it. You know? Yeah. Uh, I was really interested in the work. Well, thank you for this. Okay. I was really interested in the work um, that you're talking about in terms of rhythm setting the stage for the acquisition of syntax. Um, and I was interested because that kind of, uh, the rhythmic sensitivity has been brought into the reading world and people talk there about um, rhythm and prosody setting the stage for morphological acquisition, for phonological stuff, for vocabulary stuff. But I haven't seen anybody linking it to the syntax. Isn't that interesting? So, I, I was interested in maybe hearing more about the baby stuff or whether you thought that at the reading level the syntax is just too rich. You know, you were talking about right. simple word order. Right, or like, right, yeah. right. Um, so again, the studies that I know yeah. <laughs> are all the baby yeah, studies. Totally. Um, and so um, they, the, so basically where this work comes from, I, I think probably Marina Nespor and Jacques Mailer have yeah. had, um, have, uh, put forth Marina really the most fleshed out okay. prosodic bootstrapping but also um, Jim Morgan there are several okay. groups that okay. have and and they do like there are typologists linguistics typologists who go around the world you know and mm -hmm. measure and uh, the rhythmical characteristics of different languages and so basically in English we, we have we we use a lot of cues but the dominant cue is that these function words like determiners and prepositions mm -hmm. and stuff are shorter in duration than a matched content word, like a noun, et cetera, of the same um, number of syllables. Yeah. And um, words, and so that's a really strong cue. Yeah. But there are yeah. other cues as well, whereas they're, high, they're lower in pitch in languages with opposite word orders. Yeah. Um, but there are, there are, and there, there are, there are rhythmical cues at the word level, at the phrase level, at the yeah. clause level, at the sentence level. So there's a whole prosodic yeah. hierarchy that, yeah. And that function content distinction comes out in reading adults. Like if you do simple tasks, they skip over, they skip over. Uh, the, function, yeah. the letters and the function words over the content. Yeah. So that's yeah. pretty yeah. resonant. That's I'll interesting. take a look at it. OK, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. That's really yeah. cool. But function words help babies pull out content right. words. Right. So, um, and they remember them better if they have a word that has a function word form before the content word, they learn it better. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it's really fun, even yeah. though they don't remember the function words as well. That's actually not quite true. Gail. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so you, you know, you've got really wonderful control over all of the conditions, and you see these Maybe. really nice effects, and they're replicated, et cetera, that's wonderful. Um, really interesting sort of combination of being prepared for something and being able to discriminate versus needing exposure mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to see the, the proper um, development. 
So can you, can you take this into the real world and see differences in the way moms and dads and interact with their babies and see the difference in development of language? Right. Is, there, is there enough of a, an effect here that you can actually see it um, from uh, just from natural variation and moms that talk to their kids and moms that don't talk right. as much. And, right. and that it, I was sort of inspired by the idea, the worry about depression too, as <coughs> depression yeah. isn't just a, a getting SRIs, but depression is also how you interact with your children. Absolutely, right? and you don't do as much, you don't do as much shared right. eye gaze, you don't right. do as much um, contention interaction, right. you don't label right. what the baby's looking at right. to the same degree. Yeah. And there's no question that there are, there are lots of correlations between those characteristics of maternal input and right. vocabulary size. Right. And there are very strong correlations between just the richness of the input and vocabulary size. Mm -hmm. And, I, and there, are, there are correlations between parental, you know, parenting style, mothering, et cetera, and uh, sensitivity to things like phonotactics. Phonetic perception and basic rhythmical perception may be threshold. Mm -hmm. So it may be that you need enough, yeah. and enough is enough, and more doesn't give you right. better. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. That's right. That's yeah. right. But you need to have it in the right. in the period that right. the system is right. open for it. Yeah. If you've got an air infection, then you're getting fluctuating right. input. Um, mm -hmm. may not be a good thing. But um, again. I mean, now I'm a grandma, I'm not a mom, right? And like everybody's got their, something happened to everybody. And we get on with development and we try to help out and intervene where we can, but when I was, but that's, that's still, we want to make, we want to optimize it for, yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah? One more question. So, um, it's a very general level question. But if we think of the development of speech perception and uh, word recognition. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, um, do we agree with the folks who say that word recognition in young infants and toddlers is the same kind of representations as adult kind of word recognition? Or are those word level representations different? So that's a great question. I mean, so this, the section of the talk that I skipped over was the section where we look at the detail and the representations, and maybe that was part of the class, or I should have given to one of those questions. And so it does look like by 17 to 20 months or so, babies are using, are representing words with, well, it's seven and a half months of words, just bare words. They seem to have a lot of the detail in. And by 18 to 20 months, they're using that detail to guide word learning and in a language-specific way. But that doesn't mean that the representation is the same as an adult. And so there's a lot that goes on in infancy. And I think it's the same as it is with visual acuity. You get, you make a lot of progress, and you do so very quickly. But the last little bit takes a lot longer. So the sharpness of uh, uh, a young adult phonetic category and ability to recognize a word, and particularly if it's in their first language, is much more precise, again, than that of a 12-month-old or an 18-month-old or even a five or six-year-old. So the categories, the phonetic categories sharpen more. And we think that this is bidirectional with learning to read, learning an alphabet and everything as well, that that's one source of input that contributes to the sharpening of those phonetic categories. And it probably has, there, you know, you don't, you probably, I'm not sure it has any implications in everyday language processing, but it might. So if we put you in a, a really sensitive psychophysical procedure, like a gating task, where you hear the first 20 milliseconds of a syllable, and then 30 milliseconds, and then 40, and when can you recognize it? Uh, you recognize it earlier if you're a young adult, it's your first language, you haven't had ear infections, et cetera. And does that have consequences for online processing? At some point, if the difference is too big, it does. Um, so like when I'm lecturing rapidly to a group of students and a high percentage of them have English as a second language, I know that that has processing consequences. But so whether it does the difference, if it's your first language, you know, I, I don't know if it's a big enough difference. 
But again, there's probably work on it, and I don't know it. Yeah. Okay, um, before we thank Janet for her talk, I just want to mention to everybody that we're, we're going to be moving over to the University Club Pub for a post colloquium beer. Um, for those of you who want to continue the conversation or chat with Janet about anything else, um, we hope to see you over there. And thank you again. That was fantastic.